Hello, everyone, and welcome to the multi learning seminar. Happy New Year. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Keegan Harris. Keegan uh, is a fourth year PhD student at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, where he is advised by Nina Valkan and Stephen Wu and has been supported by the ND SEC Fellowship. His research interests include machine learning, algorithmic and theory, econometrics, and their various, various intersections. And previously, Kian was an intern at the Economics and Computation Group at Micro, Microsoft Research, and he received a Master in Science in Machine Learning from Carnegie Mellon University, a Bachelor in Science in Computer Science from Penn State University, and a BS in Physics from Penn State University. And today, he's going to talk about online meta learning in games and bandits. So, without any further ado, uh, Kian. Uh, for yours. Great, thanks. And thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, and if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to um, feel free to stop me. So today I'll be talking about um, meta learning and games in uh, time permitting, maybe in uh, bandits as well. And uh, this is, I guess before I get started, this is joint work with a lot of people and particularly on the game side, this is joint work with uh, Ioannis, Gabriella, Misha, uh, Thomas and my co-advisor Stephen, and then uh, for the stuff I'll talk about with bandits, this is joint work with Nina, who's my other co-advisor, uh, Misha again, uh, Kfir, Ron, Ilya, uh, and Stephen again. And so I guess maybe this talk will follow a somewhat uh, non-standard structure. Uh, so first I'll sort of give an intro to meta learning in online settings and provide some structural results, which while they may not appear explicitly in either uh, paper, will be good for, at least I hope will be good for intuition and understanding. After this, I'll talk about how we can apply some of these tools and techniques to games and some of the challenges which occur there. Uh, and then, you know, time permitting, I'll talk about the same thing, but with uh, adversarial bandits. So um, meta learning or um, learning to learn is basically this idea or a notion that if you have a sequence of tasks which may be related, I want to use my experience in solving these possibly similar tasks in order to do well at some current task at hand. So, you know, just intuitively, uh, say I learn how to catch a baseball and then I learn how to catch a tennis ball. Um, based on my experiences catching those two types of balls, I should be able to learn how to catch a basketball much quicker than if I um, had not had this previous experience. And so uh, to formalize this a bit, what we're interested in is a so-called online with an online learning setup where we face a sequence of T tasks. Um, you know, each task has M time steps. So the way you should picture this in your head is I interact with the first task. Maybe this is catching a baseball uh, sequentially for M time steps. And then this task goes away forever. I get a new task. Maybe this is catching a tennis ball. I interact with this task for M time steps, you know, so on and so forth. Until I get to my last task, which let's say is catching a basketball. I interact with this task for M time steps, and then I'm done. And so, um, you know, we're interested in uh, algorithms for these settings with provable performance guarantees. So a natural question is how do we measure success? Well, in a single task regime, uh, sort of a natural answer to that is regret. Basically, what we want here is um, when I compare the performance of our algorithm, um, with the performance of some optimal action in hindsight. So just to introduce a bit of notation, uh, say that at each time the learner picks some strategy x i, uh, where I'm using i to index uh, time steps from some allowable strategy space script x. And let's just say that um, the utility they receive at time step i is some uh, inner product between the strategy x i in some utility vector UI. And uh, let's just assume that this um, UI is given by some external process for now. Uh, basically what we wanna do here is we wanna compare the performance of what we actually got with um, the performance of sort of the optimal strategy in our strategy space in hindsight over the, um, over the M time steps. 
Um, so this is, you know, sort of the standard notion of regret, which is applicable in the single task regime. Um, what we're interested in here is uh, minimizing so-called task average regret, where basically what we do here is, you know, take uh, the same notion of regret I just described above, but then index it by uh, the task T. So now, um, you know, you're at, for each task at each time step, you play a different um, strategy. And in each uh, task, we're comparing to the optimal and hindsight strategy for that particular task. And basically what we're interested in here is uh, task average regret. So averaging um, the regret across all tasks. And so, yeah, basically, if this is small, then on average, across all tasks, we're doing well. And so we have uh, a couple goals for our meta-learning procedure. Uh, the first one is that if the tasks are somehow similar, um, then we want to do better by meta-learning than if we hadn't meta-learned. So in particular, um, we want our task average regret rates to be lower than uh, what the regret rates would have been had we just played a non-meta-learning algorithm uh, repeatedly in all tasks. Um, at the same time, if the tasks are not related, we don't want to. We don't want meta-learning to hurt us. So in particular, we should do um, no worse than if we had just sort of ignored the fact that we're in this meta-learning regime, and we had instead played a single-task regret minimization algorithm for every task. Um, up to lower order terms. So, you know, it's fine if this like makes our constant worse, but we don't want to go from, for example, um, T to the half regret to T to the two thirds regret. Like that would be bad. Um, and so these are our two, our two goals. And uh, importantly, we want to be um, agnostic to how similar the tasks are a priori. So we want to be able to run our algorithm and get these guarantees without seeing ahead of time um, how similar the tasks are. And so the high level uh, idea of our approach is to meta learn uh, the initialization and the tuning parameters of popular online learning algorithms. For games, we'll meta learn these parameters of algorithms which are commonly used to learn in games. And uh, likewise, for bandits, we'll do the same. And so I guess this general style of analysis is known as uh, average regret upper bound analysis or RUBA. Uh, so this is some work, I guess this analysis first showed up in work um, by Misha and uh, Nina, as well as Amit Tallwalker. Um, basically in like more uh, vanilla online learning settings and sort of our contribution in these uh, two works is to uh, look at what happens if you meta learn in these more like I guess complex settings where uh, sort of one dimension of complexity is you're in a game and your utility is a function of uh, other players' actions as well. And then this other um, more complex setting is um, this so-called bandit feedback setting. So now you don't have full feedback, you just see the um, utility for the action which you've taken. And so, Again, now it's sort of like walk you through a structural result with an algorithm, which is hopefully uh, familiar to some people. So um, in particular, I'll introduce like a meta-learning variant of hedge. Um, but first I need to introduce hedge. So hedge is an online learning algorithm, which um, plays a strategy over um, D actions. You can think of this as like a point in a D dimensional probability simplex. And the way it works is as follows. So um, at uh, the first time step, we play sort of the uniform strategy. And then, um, yeah, so at each time step, we play our strategy X sub I. Um, we obtain some utility, which is uh, the inner product between the strategy we play and some utility vector, where, um, you know, for now, you could think of U of I as being uh, generated by an adversary that's possibly trying to harm the performance of our algorithm. Uh, we're sort of in this so-called full feedback regime. Uh, so we get to observe U of I after the fact. And then since we observe U of I, we can update our strategy for the next time step. In particular, we update it um, multiplicatively um, 
proportional to the exponent of um, how much utility that action um, would have gotten us. And we do this coordinate wise uh, for all D actions. Uh, and so here, this eta is the, uh, the step size of the learning rate. Uh, and then this phi is just a normalization constant to make sure we have like valid probabilities at every time step. And sort of a well-known result is that, um, you know, suppose our strategies at every time step are chosen by hedge, um, then regret is upper bounded by um, the following. So we, it's upper bounded by log D, where we're called D is the number of actions over eta, this learning rate, uh, plus eta times M. And what this applies, implies is that um, by appropriately selecting uh, eta, we can get square root M log D regret. And so um, now if you want to talk about like what a meta, uh, like meta learning version of hedge would look like, uh, it's, it's very similar. So, uh, you know, you still play over D actions, uh, but now we sort of have this outer loop over tasks. Um, and in particular, what changes here is the initialization. So instead of just initializing to the uniform distribution like we did in the single task setting, we're now gonna be a bit more clever. So we're going to initialize to, um, I guess a convex combination between uh, the uniform distribution and the previous uh, optima in hindsight. So the optimum strategy for each of the, uh, the previously seen tasks so far. And then uh, we're just going to proceed as normal. So I guess this is sort of like a, a meta point, which is that, um, like I said, you can meta learn the initialization and the tuning parameters. So in theory, you could meta learn eta, but for the purposes of this talk, we're not gonna talk about learning any hyperparameters. We're just gonna fix the hyperparameters, but this is like something that's valid to do. Uh, but in this version of uh, meta hedge, all we're doing is we're meta learning the initialization. Oh, um, yes, I see there's a question. Yeah, um, I was wondering, so you initialize with the strategy of the previous task, right? So how does the strategy map to the new task? Like, when you say strategy, I'm thinking like policy. So are the states and actions similar across different tasks? Yeah, exactly. So I guess we're in a... Um... I guess a rather simple setting in which there's not really a notion of state, um, but the action set is indeed the same across tasks. Okay. Yeah, so these like the dimension of these objects is the same across tasks, which is why we can just like uh, do this averaging here. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, so yeah, this is uh, our meta learning version of hedge. Um, and then something which I will hand waverly prove in a, in a bit is that um, we can get sort of an analogous guarantee for task average regret for our, um, our meta hedge algorithm. In particular, the task average regret of meta hedge is upper bounded by uh, three terms. One is this uh, term which I'm denoting by OT of one, which is a lower order term. So this is a term which goes to zero as the number of tasks goes to infinity. infinity. This is, um, the smaller order term, which is like the quote unquote penalty we play for pay for meta learning. Although, like I said, this term will go away as the number of tasks grows large. Uh, we also have this eta times m term, which should look uh, familiar from the single task uh, regret bound. And then we have a term here, which um, this uh, h of x over eta term. So recall, um, recall in a single task setting, uh, this was log D over eta. So now we're essentially replacing log D by this H of X bar. Um, so, so what is this H of X bar? Well, um, basically it's the Shannon entropy of the average of the optimum and hindsight strategies. So basically um, take all the optimum and hindsight strategies from uh, task one up to task capital T, um, average them together and then take the Shannon entropy uh, that's the that's this term right here. And 
you know, why is this, uh, why is this good? So in one extreme, if all the tasks are the same, then this, um, this entropy will be very small. And so um, this term in the regret bound will be very small. Um, but, you know, suppose we have this other extreme, which is the tasks are um, not similar at all. Uh, well, you can show that um, the Shannon entropy is always over bounded by log D. So um, even in the worst case, when the tasks are like quote unquote maximally dissimilar, uh, we essentially recover the uh, single task regret bound, at least up to these lower order terms. And yeah, so this is sort of like a, um, a structural result, which I hope will provide a bit of uh, intuition for um, what's to come. And uh, just to say just a few words about um, how one would get this result, I'll walk you through a quick proof sketch. Um, but in order to do that, I need to introduce a little bit of notation. So uh, the first thing is just the uh, KL divergence between two uh, strategies in this d-dimensional uh, probability simplex. And the other one is just a shorthand for, um, I guess, a convex combination between the optimal strategy at time t and uh, the uniform distribution over the d-actions. And so uh, the first step in uh, the style of analysis is to extract a um, so-called initialization dependent regret upper bound for the single task setting. And so um, I guess recall that for hedge, the upper bound I showed you did not depend on the initialization of the, of the, uh, the learner, but it turns out with a, a bit of work, you can, um, you can obtain one which depends on the initialization. And this is like a common theme across a lot of different online learning algorithms. You know, usually the uh, regret upper bound that's presented does not depend on the initialization. And that's just because like, if you're in the single task regime, you know, you probably should just initialize to the uniform distribution because in some sense you don't know any better. Uh, but for us, you know, what we initialize to like actually matters. And so we need to sort of go back and dig out like a, a regret upper bound, which depends on this initialization. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is, um, oh, and I guess um, I should say that for hedge, um, this initialization dependent regret upper bound um, takes the form of like, you know, these two terms, which depend linearly on M uh, plus this Kale divergence term. In particular, it's the um, Kale divergence between um, the, uh, I guess the optimal and hindsight strategy mixed with this um, uniform distribution and the strategy we initialize to. So x t comma one is the initialization uh, task t. Uh, next, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to add and subtract this other KL divergence term. This is essentially um, uh, what will pop out as our uh, notion of task similarity. Um, this part right here is like, you know, take some, take some handholding, like this is a, this is a lemma, like in an appendix, but basically we can show that this difference here is small. In fact, it vanishes like one over T. Um, and so what we're left with is like this, you know, quote unquote fast term, which decays as the number of tasks goes to infinity. And then this, uh, this KL divergence term here, um, which essentially measures the distance on average between um, the X tilde and the, I guess, like centroid or something. Um, and then from there, it's really just a, a matter of using um, like some tools from like convex analysis and some properties of like Kale divergencies and things like that in order to like massage this and get our final regret bound. And so this is essentially what I showed you on the, the previous slide, just with um, like the lower order term not hidden. Okay, so that's like, um, that's sort of our structural result, which, um, you know, while, while it doesn't appear like directly in either of the papers is something that's like good to keep in the back of your head uh, for what I will be talking about.
And so um, really the focus of my talk today is um, this so-called strategic setting. So this is the setting in which like the utility vectors for each player at every time are not generated by like say an adversary, but um, maybe are um, generated through playing a game. So the utility that, um, you know, this meta learner gets is not just a function of their strategy, but the strategies of um, a bunch of other players. So, you know, what happens if we meta learn in this setting? Why maybe we want to do this? What are some of the uh, challenges which we may encounter? Uh, and then sort of um, the same thing, but um, relaxing along a different dimension, which is this notion of bandit feedback. So um, here, you know, now you don't get to observe the entire utility vector. Maybe you just get to observe the utility for, um, for the action that you played. How does this affect things? Uh, but yeah, so I'll mostly be focusing on the first part, uh, time permitting. I'll touch a bit on uh, the second part. But does anyone have any uh, questions up to this point? Cool. Yeah, so if not, um, I'll talk about our, our setting. So um, in particular, we're interested in the so-called repeated game setting, where we have a set of end players. Um, and t different games. So now tasks sort of map to games. And by different games, I just mean um, different player uh, utility functions, or you should just think of uh, each player as having a corresponding payoff matrix. So in particular, the number of players remains constant across the games, but each of their utility functions may change. Uh, and then each game is repeated for m time steps each. And yeah, so the utility function for um, player K in this game is um, not just a function of their strategy, uh, but it's a function of the strategies of all other players in the game. And so like we allow for uh, this utility function to be Lipschitz, but you should just think of this as like a matrix game in which, um, you know, like the payoff for each player is given by like a, a index in a matrix. And so um, we're gonna be looking at the setting in which all players in the game are regret minimizers. And so this is the same notion of regret that I presented uh, earlier. Now it's just indexed by a player K. So we talk about the regret for player K in task T. And that's that's what this is. But it's like the same same notion. And there are sort of two, two views in which you could um, come at this. So like one way you could come at this is from this like learning point of view where there really are n players in the game and they're all learning through these um, no regret dynamics. Uh, but another way you could look at this is from an equilibrium computation point of view. So many times, uh, in, in particular, in these like large extensive form games, uh, actually the state of the art procedure for um, just computing an equilibria of the game is to set up a bunch of uh, no regret players and then simulate their dynamics for um, a number of time steps. And this will get you like an epsilon approximate, either like Nash equilibria or correlated equilibria. Um, and so, yeah, I guess just like whatever view you want to keep in your head. Um, And so I guess an example of when, you know, you as a strategic individual may meta learn is uh, say like you have a weekly poker night with your friends uh, and each week you bring a different amount of money to the table. Uh, so the amount of money you bring to the table will change uh, your optimal strategy of play. Uh, however, your strategy of play for say a hundred dollars is going to be very similar to like how you should optimally play if you had $101. So intuitively, uh, you should leverage your previous experiences in the strategic setting uh, in order to do better, I guess, for your current um, amount of money you bring to the table, even if you've never exactly played with $101, for example. And sort of the other thing we need to uh, be mindful of in games is the feedback structure. So 
Uh, one thing I mentioned earlier was this notion of adversarial feedback where um, the utility vector each time step is chosen by you know, quote unquote nature in order to harm the learner. Uh, so that's not what's going on in games. Uh, so in games we have so-called, at least what I call strategic feedback where um, you know this learning agent is really a player in a game and their utility is a function of all players' actions. So it's not like, so their utility is not just um, a function of their own action you know, it's not stochastic, but at the same time, it's not being chosen by some adversary in order to harm them. You know, it's weaker than that. And so what we want to do is we want to take advantage of this. In particular, there's this uh, line of work on so-called optimistic learning algorithms in games. And uh, I won't go uh, too deep into this, but basically what this often boils down to is a one-step recency bias. So basically you have a bunch of no regret learning algorithms and what they do is they um, double count the previous loss and it turns out that if all players do this um, you know I'll, I'll say like you know all players are optimistic then uh, we can get much better regret rates uh, in particular we can get uh, exponentially better regret rates in some settings so you can go from like the usual m to the half rates to uh, logarithmic in M, or sometimes even constant in M rates. And the intuition here for why this uh, happens is because, you know, if all players are regret minimizers, then the loss vector for any individual player changes very slowly from round to round. And so that's why, you know, sort of like double counting the previous loss can be uh, helpful because it's like a good prediction of what your loss would be at the uh, current time step. Okay, so that's like the general setting. Uh, and what follows, I'll sort of give an overview of our, um, our results in various game settings, in particular uh, zero-sum games, um, general-sum games, and then stock over games. And sort of the uh, analysis of these results proceeds like very similarly to um, the, uh, the outline of the proof sketch that I showed you earlier. And so I guess the first result will be for two-player zero-sum games, um, where it's known that uh, no regret learning dynamics converge to Nash equilibria. And so our, our main theorem says that, um, you know, suppose both players are playing optimistic gradient descent. Uh, so I hope most people here are familiar with uh, the gradient descent algorithm, but if not, uh, you can think about the player as essentially just playing hedge. Um, is a different algorithm, but the results you would get are similar. Um, but now we're playing the optimistic version of that. So now each player is double counting the previous loss. Uh, and on top of that, they're meta-learning across tasks. So um, here is just for the fixed learning rate, um, but you know, there's no reason they can't meta-learn the learning rate. Uh, but the important thing is they're playing follow the leader over the previous Optima and hindsight strategies for their initialization. So what this means is they're just doing that averaging thing I talked about earlier, where um, at time t, you're averaging the optimal and hindsight strategy for all tasks uh, from one to t minus one, and you're setting that as your initialization. Um, here, since you're playing optimistic gradient descent, you actually, the fact that it's gradient descent means you don't need to um, sort of mix in with the uniform distribution, but that's sort of, um, that's not too important. But anyway, suppose all players do this. Um, then we can upper bound the Nash gap, which is essentially the, um, the average regret of the two players as follows. So on the right here, we have the, um, this lower order term, which decays as the number of tasks, or in this case, the number of games goes to infinity. Um, and then we have a term here, which looks like the Nash gap you would get had you not meta-learned, except you have these, these Vs in here, and these Vs are our notion of uh, task similarity. In particular, um, V is um, basically the uh, the average distance between uh, the optimal strategy at time t and uh, I guess like the minimizer of this, so like the centroid, um, averaged across all tasks. So if the tasks have very similar optima and hindsight strategies for player x, um, then this V of X term will be very small. 
Uh, but if the optimal and hindsight strategies for player X are, um, are not very similar, then this term is always upper bounded by um, what you would get had you not meta learned. And like V of Y is defined analogously for player Y. So we have two players in this game, X and Y. Um, and yeah, so this uh, matches the best known rates, uh, or at least they were the best known rates uh, for the single game regime when we published the paper. Um, if, uh, and this holds even if the, um, the games are maximally dissimilar, where again, similarity is measured by this V term. Um, but we can improve upon the rates in the single task regime if the optimum and hindsight strategies are similar. And like by similar, I mean according to this particular definition of similarity. And it turns out, um, Okay, and then I guess this is essentially the same bound I presented, but um, inverted. So another thing people care about in, in zero sum games is how many um, iterations it takes to reach a um, epsilon Nash equilibria. And we can compute like similar things in this setting. Um, in particular, we can um, give an upper bound on, on average how many iterations it will take to reach a um, order epsilon Nash equilibria if all players are meta-learning in the way that I described in the previous slide. And so again, um, we have this like lower order term here, which decays as the number of tasks goes to infinity. Um, and then again, we have uh, a term which looks very similar to what we would get in the single task regime, except it depends on this notion of task similarity. Um, and again, it's the same story. You know, if the tasks are similar, this term is gonna be much smaller than um, what it would be had we not meta learned, but it, it can never be larger. Uh, okay, so that's like um, the type of result we would get uh, for zero sum games. So now let's talk about general sum games. So in these settings, um, no regret learning dynamics are not known to converge to um, Nash equilibria, but instead, uh, either correlated equilibria or coarse correlated equilibria, which um, if you're not familiar, is just like a, a weaker notion of equilibria. And so um, what we can say here is that when all players play optimistic hedge, so hedge is the algorithm I showed you in the beginning of the talk, uh, they play this optimistic version um, with the same initialization procedure which I described, then um, the average regret of player K is bounded by um, the following. So essentially this is what I showed you um, in the beginning of the talk with the, um, this was a um, just linear in M term instead of a logarithmic in M term here in, so this, I guess, exponential improvement comes from the fact that uh, we're in a game and all players are optimistic. But besides that, uh, this is essentially the same regret upper bound, uh, where, yeah, this H is defined uh, earlier. And yeah, again, like I said, this sort of implies convergence to coarse correlated equilibria. Um, in the paper, we also have, um, I guess, meta-learning guarantees for minimizing so-called swap regret, which is a stronger notion of regret and this will get you convergence guarantees to correlated equilibria, which are, um, I guess, a more refined notion of uh, equilibria compared to coarse correlated equilibria, as the as the name suggests. Uh, and the sort of the last game setting I'll talk about today is um, Stackelberg uh, security games, uh, in particular the online variant. And so um, what this is, is this is a sequential interaction between uh, one player called a uh, defender and a sequence of M uh, so-called attackers. Um, I guess if you're familiar with like the sort of canonical Stockover game setting, but not the security game setting, uh, the defender is like the leader and the attackers are like uh, followers. Uh, so 
again, this is a M round interaction for each game uh, in each round. Um, the defender commits to a coverage probability vector over uh, D targets. Uh, you could just think of them as committing to some mixed strategy. And then the attacker best responds by attacking some target uh, and then payoffs are realized. This process is repeated for M time steps and then that's like one, um, that's one game. And we're in this meta learning setting, so we uh, consider like T of these different interactions. Um, and so in this setting, um, the attacker is one of K types. And by type, I just mean payoff matrix. So these different attackers get different utilities for um, attacking different targets. And uh, we're in the setting in which the, the leader or the defender knows what these K types are, but they don't know the type of the current um, attacker they're facing until after the round is over. And the uh, sequence of followers or attackers can be chosen adversarially. And so the, um, the question is, how do we learn in this setting? So in particular, the defender's goal is to minimize, uh, I guess, the corresponding notion of Stackelberg regret. Um, which is basically, um, you know, I guess regret is regret. It's um, how well we did versus uh, the optimal thing to do. Although in this setting, um, the regret of the leader is a, um, I guess, is highly nonlinear because um, the um, utility you get at time i and task t is the inner product between your mixed strategy and this utility vector. However, this utility vector is a function of the best response of the attacker, which is itself a, bet, a function of the um, mixed strategy you played. Um, and so the algorithm idea, which is, is not from us, it's from uh, this paper in 2015, is um, essentially what they show is that if you play uh, multiplicative weights over some carefully constructed finite set of mixed strategies, um, then this suffices to achieve um, no stack up or regret against an adversarially chosen sequence of attackers. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take their algorithm and we're going to meta learn the initialization across tasks. And um, what we can show is that, um, again, we get sort of analogous guarantees. We get, um, we get this term over here, which decays as the number of tasks goes to infinity. And we get um, a term on the, on the left, which is sort of looks like um, what they get, um, but with this h of y bar term instead of, um, instead of the log, in this case, of epsilon. Uh, and, you know, it's the same story. Um, our regret rates are never worse, but they can be better, in particular, if the sequence of followers is similar across, uh, across different games. Um, and our notion of similarity here is captured by h of y bar, where y bar is the uh, task average of the optima and hindsight distributions over the mixed strategies. Um, so in just to like give you a, a quick tour of the rest of um, the paper, like other results we have, um, one I mentioned earlier is algorithms for converging to correlated equilibria in general some games, uh, convergence to Nash equilibria in potential games, uh, and then like social welfare guarantees for meta learning agents and smooth games. Um, so, we empirically evaluated our methods uh, using two poker end games from the brains versus AI poker competition. So this was a, a competition back in 2015, I think, um, between like some of the world's best poker players and uh, Labratus, which is a poker agent developed by uh, some people at CMU. Uh, I think you can see yeah, Thomas right there in the picture, uh, Noam Brown there. So basically what we did is we took two end games and we varied the stack sizes. Um, and varying the stack sizes of each player, um, you know, will change their optimal strategy. And then we meta learned across these stack sizes. So this roughly maps to the, uh, like intuitive poker example I gave you earlier in the talk. 
And yeah, this is because you know different stack sizes lead to different optimal strategies for the players. And um, we considered three different stack orderings. Uh, so the first is just random. So there's like some random shuffling. Uh, the second is sorted. So um, we go from smallest stack size to largest stack size. And then uh, the last is alternating. And um, you know, while our theoretical guarantees are agnostic to the ordering, we wanted to see in practice, you know, which um, uh, which settings, you know, give the algorithm trouble and which ones does it do better in. And uh, yeah, so the algorithm we'll use for, uh, for this is just optimistic gradient descent. And so here we have some results. So in the table at the top, we have uh, the different end games. So you have the board setting for the end game, um, the current pot size, and then um, I guess the rest of the numbers are just essentially measures of how like how large the game is in particular, how large the end game is. So in particular, the last column shows the the number of non-zeros in the payoff matrix. So like these are you know, fairly large games, um, and then what we have shown in the plots is the task average Nash gap. So this is the, the first theoretical result I showed you for zero sum games. Uh, we're plotting this in end game A. And um, our three different plots correspond to the three different, um, I guess, sequences of tasks. So the first is random stacks, the second is sorted stacks, and the third is alternating stacks. Um, and then the three things we're plotting are, um, uh, I guess no meta learning, which is our baseline. This is an orange um, meta learning, uh, where we're initializing to the uh, the average of the optima in hindsight, which is what I presented the theoretical guarantees for. Um, that is in blue, and then a different version of meta learning, which is where we just initialize to um, the last iterate of the previous task. Uh, this is in green, but maybe don't worry too much about that one. And you can see that you know across the board, no matter what the um, the sequence of tasks is, um, our meta learning algorithm does much better than if we had not meta learned. And you know you see a, a similar story for um, for end game B as well. I guess it does a bit better in end game B than end game A. Um, so are there any questions? Oh yeah. David. Yeah, good timing on that. Um, if you go back one slide uh, and look at the the middle plot, why does the how come uh, the blue line, well, all the lines I guess start to increase, but the orange line doesn't increase uh, till about one eighty, but mm -hmm. task one eighty, but uh, the other two increase right around like task one forty looks like right yeah yeah that's a good question so the reason why they're increasing is um i guess something happens in the game um so this is for sorted stacks so something happens around um like when you get to the higher stacks where um uh for some reason i guess it gets harder for the um uh harder to learn in these settings that's why you see the orange line increase um the the blue and the green lines start increasing before the orange line uh, because um, in that setting, uh, I guess essentially the uh, the optimal strategy for the previous tasks around this 150 line starts to not become a uh, good indicator of the optimal strategy in the current task at hand. Um, and so initializing to that is like sort of hurting us in that setting. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Yep. Uh, any any other questions about games? Cool. So if not, um, I guess I can just briefly highlight our results for um, meta learning and bandits. Um, and so here, you know, we're not in this multi-agent setting anymore. We're um, in the so-called adversarial multi-arm bandit setting where um, we have k arms and m time steps. Um, let's just assume we have an oblivious adversary. So the adversary picks the losses for each arm and time step up front, uh, possibly using uh, knowledge of 
the learner's algorithm, but not knowledge of like the random bits. Um, and then the learner picks an arm at each time step. And what makes this different from uh, the previous results I showed is that um, they receive a loss. I'll be using losses here instead of utilities just um, to be consistent with the literature, but it's the same thing. But anyways, they receive the loss only for the, uh, the chosen arm as opposed to observing the entire utility vector, which is what we had previously assumed. And again, you know, you would want to minimize some notion of regret here, which is the same thing that I have uh, had listed earlier. Um, and so like sort of the algorithm I'll be using here is exp3, uh, just because it's very similar to hedge. Um, the only difference is uh, you know, now we need to estimate the losses of each uh, of each action. They're not just given to us. Um, and the idea here is to do this with a so-called importance weighted loss estimator, which is an unbiased estimate of the loss at each time step. Um, so it is, I guess it's given down here the exact mathematical um, equation if you're interested. Um, and sort of like the so-called price of bandit feedback we incur is um, you know, our single task regret rates go from logarithmic in D to like square root of D, where D is the number of actions. And again, you know, you can define like a, a meta version of uh, exp3 where we uh, meta learn the initialization. Um, here, you know, we need to um, initialize to the previous estimated optima in hindsight, though, um, because we don't know the true optima in hindsight strategy because we don't get to see the utility vectors at each time step. So the best thing we can do is estimate it. Um, again, you know, I'm sort of understating our results uh, for like purposes of simplicity because we're not meta learning these other parameters and even the regret rates I'll show you are not um, really the best we can do. This is just sort of like the simplest version. Um, but basically what we could show is that, you know, with high probability, this meta exp3 algorithm obtains uh, the following task average regret guarantee, um, where this is essentially the same thing we had earlier, um, but now um, this H is the Shannon entropy of the estimated optima in hindsight. And again, this is uh, the case because this is what we're initializing to. We don't get to observe the true optima in hindsight. Um, Similarly to the single task regime, this matches the regret rates of the XP3 in the worst case, um, but they can be much better. Um, and then it turns out that with um, a gap assumption, so if you assume like knowledge of a gap between the best and second best arm across all tasks, uh, it's possible to replace uh, the entropy of the estimated optima in hindsight with the entropy of the actual optima in hindsight. Uh, but again, we need this gap uh, assumption. And again, this isn't like really the regret rates we get. Uh, what we get is, uh, I guess, is something a bit more complicated, but um, it's something that's better, but a bit more complicated to show. Um, so some other results that are in the paper in case you're interested. Um, so like, you know, you don't need to use exp3 in particular. Um, if you just care about getting the best rates, you shouldn't use exp3. You should use something um, with, like, I guess, like a more complicated loss estimator, which gets you better single task rates. So that's what we actually use in the paper. Um, and then, like I said, you can meta learn the tuning parameters as well. Um, yeah, we also have this gap assumption, which allows us to get regret rates based on the true optima in hindsight instead of um, estimated. Uh, and then we also have results for linear bandits. So in particular, we have results for meta-learning um, for bandit linear optimization over the unit sphere and um, banded online shortest path problems. Uh, although I guess the notion of task similarity in these settings is uh, much more complicated and not easily uh, stable. So um, let me see, I have five minutes left, so I'll just wrap up quickly. Um, so what I presented here were various algorithms for meta-learning under um, strategic and adversarial bandit feedback. Um, so in the game setting, what we focused on was um, 
convergence guarantees to Nash Equilibria in two-player zero-sum games. Um, for general sum games, we looked at uh, convergence guarantees of meta-learning algorithms to, uh, I guess, course-correlated equilibria. And then we also had results for things like stack over games, potential games, et cetera. Um, and then we empirically evaluated our results on like these poker end games. Uh, under bandit feedback, we looked at uh, two cases. The first is adversarial multi-arm bandits, and then the uh, second is linear bandits. As far as directions for future research go, um, I think an interesting direction would be to uh, develop meta-learning algorithms for uh, contextual bandit settings. Um, and then also sort of just like a broader theory of meta-learning. So this goes back to um, a question we got earlier, uh, which, um, you know, sort of hinting at the fact that like the strategy space for each of the tasks needs to be the exact same. Uh, but, you know, in reality, that may not be the case, uh, but we still may be able to gain insights from solving these different tasks. So, like, how do we handle that in, like, a principled way? Um, so, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you for the great talk, Keegan. Uh, if I'm going to stop the recording now. If anyone has any questions for Stephen, can ask them just after stop the recording.